Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. Welcome to IISS. I think we should uh, try to make a start. Um, I'm Nigel Inkster, uh, the Director for Transnational Threats and Political Risk here at IISS. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome our uh, guest speaker here this evening. Um, those of you who are know, know enough to actually come to this event really don't need me to spend an awful lot of time introducing our speaker, Dr. Matt Levitt, you know, who, to cut a long story short, I think is uh, one of a worryingly few number of uh, genuine experts uh, on areas of uh, international terrorism that have not always been um, at the fashionable end of terrorism studies. Um, and with a particular focus on um, Iranian-inspired terrorism and Hezbollah. You know, Matt uh, has uh, worked this uh, beat um, in, in government, doing some groundbreaking work on areas like terrorist financing. And since he moved into academia, he's uh, written a lot uh, on, on um, that and also on, on the subject that we are really here to talk about, which is Hezbollah's global reach. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Matt, I was going to say as an old friend of the Institute, but I'm on shaky ground here. I will say long-standing friend of the Institute. Matt, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Nigel. And, and old friend is quite fine. I'm a little bit older than I look. I have, I have a 20-year-old son. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back at uh, IISS, and, and it's, it's an honor. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, allow me to jump right into it. Hezbollah is lots of things. It's a political movement in Lebanon. It's a social welfare provider in Lebanon. It's a standing militia in Lebanon, the largest standing militia, the only one allowed to maintain and in indeed increase its weapons after the Taif Accords that ended the Civil War. And if you don't appreciate that Hezbollah is all those things, in very real ways, political actor, social actor, then you, you don't understand, let alone appreciate Hezbollah. But if that's all you understand Hezbollah to be, you also don't understand or appreciate all that Hezbollah is. And it became very clear to me after I left the FBI, and I'll give you a story underscoring how and why, that there was a gaping hole in the literature on Hezbollah, in particular about its activities beyond Lebanon's border, or another way you might uh, describe it is on the more covert side of Hezbollah's activities, the overt political, social welfare activity. Even a lot of the militia activity was relatively overt, and there was a lot of literature on it, but nothing on this. When I left the FBI, my last assignment was leading the analytical team for Flight 175, the second flight to the Trade Center. I was invited to a U.S. government conference in Washington, unclassified, but for, uh, by invitation only, for current and former government analysts on Lebanon. It was co-sponsored by the CIA and the State Department's Intelligence and Research Branch, the State Department's uh, INR, their intelligence office. And uh, most of the speakers were academics and journalists brought in from Lebanon. The first few panels were about uh, all things Lebanon domestic, social, political things that certainly at the time, and in many ways even now, are, are beyond my expertise, and was really tremendously interesting, and I was taking copious, copious notes. Eventually, the panelists, uh, panels uh, turned over and they started talking about things that are a little bit more in, in my line of expertise on intelligence and security and, and terrorism issues. And some of the speakers were saying things that were so far beyond any sense of reality that like a sudden ton of bricks shattering my sense of what the conference had been so far, because I was really impressed and pleased, I suddenly began to wonder maybe some of the other stuff that they've talked about that sounded so insightful, but I really don't know much about, maybe that's hokum too. The first thing that people said, and they tend to always say it with this same introduction, I know you Americans and Israelis, believe that Hezbollah has been involved in all kinds of acts of terrorism around the world, in Argentina, in Saudi Arabia, Kobar Towers, AMIA, Israeli embassies, but, but really. We all know Hezbollah is just a political social organization, and they do fight Israel and fight Israeli occupation, and that's an honorable form of resistance, and the Israelis don't like it, and so you Americans don't like it, but really, they're not involved in international terrorism. That's Al-Qaeda, so please, enough already. And then let's be mature about it. So I roll my eyes. <clears throat> then the next panel includes an academic, who grew up in the United States and moved to Lebanon and said, you know, I know you Americans and Israelis believe that there's some boogeyman out there named Imad Mugnia, some arch terrorist who heads Hezbollah's terrorist wing at 
we in the United States usually refer to as the Islamic Jihad Organization in Europe, and here in Britain usually the external security organization there, one and the same. But, said the academic, I live in Beirut and I know of no evidence that he exists. And uh, I think he's a fabrication of the Israeli imagination and you've all bought into it. So, said the academic, I did what a real academic would do. I went and I got an interview with Hassan Nasrallah himself, the Secretary General of Hezbollah. And I asked him, Ya Sayyid, does Mugnia exist? And he told me no. Ergo, oh, Mugnia doesn't exist, QED. On the sidelines of the conference, this person and I agreed a little bit vehemently to disagree. And when they opened to Q&A, I raised my hand and I said, listen, um, I do a lot of public speaking too. One of the first things you need to do is know your audience. You're going to come here and you're going to say you don't know if Hezbollah's ever done any acts of terrorism abroad. You're going to tell me you don't know if Imad Mugni exists. This is a room of, what was it, 200, 250 current and former U.S. intelligence analysts. We know. <laughs> so, 2008, February 2008, Imad Mugni, who did exist, but because he was the head of the Hezbollah's terrorist organization, was denied in life and embraced in death was assassinated in Damascus. Uh, you can now go to Lebanon and to Hezbollah's tourist museums, and you can, you can pose at his uh, gravesite with a mock-up of the ivory-handled uh, handgun that he reportedly carried when he boarded TWA-847 as it bounced back and forth from Beirut to Algiers when he boarded in, in Beirut. Very much existed. Hezbollah has since written some actually not so bad poetry about him, squares and streets named after him. He, he very much existed. I'm not a very nice person, though. And uh, when this happened, I, I wrote a very short email to this academic in Lebanon, which just said, and now we're both right. <laughs> he did exist, and now he doesn't. My wife's a much nicer person and told me that it was not a particularly mature email to send. I tell people all the time, I have four sons, my wife has five boys, and by all measure, I'm not the most mature of the bunch. But I'm wise enough to listen to her, and so I didn't send it, but I'm a petty person, so I felt better for just having drafted it. I left the conference back in 2003, and I thought to myself, how is it possible that serious people, and these were serious people, could have a position that is so ridiculous, uh, far from the, what we know to be the truth. And I had my poor research assistant do an extraordinarily extensive literature review. Is it possible that there's just not enough literature out there on Hezbollah? And the answer is, there's spectacularly large amounts of literature out there on Hezbollah, and parenthetically more and a lot of better stuff since 2003. If you want to know about Hezbollah as a political organization, which it is, and a social welfare organization, which it is, and a militia, which it is, but almost nothing about the stuff that I wrote about. So let me be clear here, as I am in the introduction to the book. This book is not intended to be the new and final say on Hezbollah by any stretch of the imagination. This is meant to complement the existing literature and fill in the gap. It's not a book about Lebanon. Not because Hezbollah in Lebanon is unimportant or not because it's not any of those things. It absolutely is. And anybody who tells you Hezbollah is just a terrorist organization or an Iranian proxy is wrong. And anybody who tells you that they're just these overt things in Lebanon is no less wrong. It is a complicated organization. It is completely different than Al-Qaeda. To say that you can talk about all terrorists in the same breath is a gross misunderstanding of the industry. Al-Qaeda is nihilistic and if they want and they could hit you today, they will. Hezbollah and Iran are very calculating. They are very strategic. They are not looking to engage in violence, but violence is a perfectly legitimate means of achieving goals. And if violence will achieve the goal quicker or better than others, then it is no more, no less legitimate than other means of achieving their goals. That puts them on the far side of the ledger of not so cool, because they're willing to engage in violence, violence targeting civilians, but it does make them markedly different than Al-Qaeda. And dealing with them, strategies for dealing with them have to be very, very different. As I went around the world investigating Hezbollah's activities outside Lebanon, often traveling to crazy places, often by virtue of being in Washington, I'm sure you have the same benefit here in London, people come to me all the time, I simply started asking questions. And since I'm not above begging, I begged for documents over nine years. And eventually I collected a very large treasure trove of declassified documents, court documents, not classified but never made public documents, and conducted interviews all over the world. If indeed the idea that Hezbollah has engaged in terrorism around the world, if it is a conspiracy, it's not an American Zionist Western conspiracy, it is truly global. 
because the information in the book comes from Chile and Argentina and Brazil, and of course, London and America, Washington and Canada. I spoke to the Israelis and the Kuwaitis and the Jordanians and the Egyptians and the Turks and the Filipinos and the Singaporeans and the Romanians and the Thais. You get my drift. All over the world. It turns out we've all had investigations. Perhaps the most interesting chapters because there are some things we know about, but not in the detail that we now have in this book about Hezbollah in South America, Hezbollah criminal activity in particular in North America, Hezbollah historically, but even today here in Europe, but Hezbollah in Africa, and not just within diaspora communities, upstanding law-abiding diaspora communities within which some small number of bad apples can hide in plain sight, or in South America, but Africa, Southeast Asia, all over the world. Fast forward to February 2008. In February 2008, Mugni is assassinated, and at his funeral by video teleconference, Hassan Nasrallah says, by video teleconference for fear that he'll be next, Israel, you want open war, let it be open war. Meaning, we're going to target you outside of the region to avenge Mugni's death. Mugni was the prince of Hezbollah. He's been succeeded by his sidekick, by his brother-in-law, Mustafa Badruddin, who sat on top of a building with Mugni up and watched the Beirut bombings unfold 30 years ago last week. And that's a telling reminder. It's actually a painful story to discuss because we now know from some of the declassified intelligence you'll read about in the book that three and a half weeks before the bombings, U.S. intelligence intercepted a telephone communication between Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and Security in Tehran and the Iranian ambassador to Damascus. And the ambassador was told to reach out to Mr. Musawi, who at the time was the head of Islamic Amal, the largest of the various Lebanese Shia militias that were coalescing under the umbrella of Hezbollah, the party of God, which at the time really was a little bit of an umbrella organization for a few months, but quickly became the structured hierarchical organization we know it to be today and instructed Musawi to carry out a spectacular action targeting the U.S. Marines. Unfortunately, this piece of information did not make its way through the bureaucracy to the desk of anybody who could do anything about it until two days after the bombing. And so it's a very painful chapter of history to discuss, but also provides us with very powerful insight into the fact that Hezbollah's first forays into first in Lebanon, then in the Gulf, Kuwait in particular, then Europe, Germany, France, Switzerland, Italy, South America was at Iran's direction. This relationship is critical to understanding Hezbollah. Like all relationships, it fluctuates over time. Always intimate, but fluctuates over time. At some points in time, you could have described it as a patron proxy relationship, not today. Today, the US intelligence community describes the Iranian Hezbollah relationship as a strategic partnership with Iran as the primary partner which explains why Hezbollah will do things at Iran's behest, such as targeting Israeli tourists around the world or intervening in Syria as it has, despite the fact that it is costing it tremendously and putting it at great risk at home and abroad. I'll get back to that in a minute. It wasn't the first time that Hezbollah targeted Western interests in Lebanon when they hit the uh, US Marines and the French military of the multinational forces. They'd already blown up our embassy. They would strike again shortly thereafter, blowing up our embassy annex, three massive attacks in 18 months that would largely dictate the course and set the stage for the U.S., really the Western relationship with Iran uh, and Hezbollah. After that, they uh, blossomed out to Kuwait, where Badruddin himself was involved in a series of seven bombings in two hours in Kuwait, was arrested, was convicted. There was a death sentence, but Hezbollah made it clear to the Kuwaitis that signing the death sentence, if the emir signed the death sentence, let alone carried it out, there would be severe repercussions. The emir never did sign it, let alone carry it out. And Badruddin sat in a jail with a de facto life sentence until Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and emptied the jails, and he made his way through the Iranian embassy to Iran and then back to Lebanon. Today, he's the head of the Islamic Jihad organization, the ESO. He's wanted, he's one of the five individuals uh, indicted by the Special Tribunal for Lebanon in The Hague for the assassination of Rafi Hariri uh, and is at the top of some of the most wanted lists around the world. The Iranian relationship with Hezbollah explains a lot of what's going on today. After Nasrallah promised open war, the Israelis didn't have to wait very long for Hezbollah to try and make good on Nasrallah's promise. And later that year in Baku, Azerbaijan, two Hezbollah operatives and several Quds Force operatives were arrested in Baku trying to assassinate the Israeli ambassador. The Iranians were quickly and quietly released after Iranian pressure. 
the two Hezbollahis were tried, convicted, sentenced, and then a few weeks later, they too, under Iranian pressure, were released uh, and are now back in Lebanon. Parenthetically, among the many themes that are woven through the book are illicit financial activities around the world and also the frequency with which operations around the world touch back on Western Europe and the United States. In the case in Baku, Azerbaijan, one of the two Hezbollahis who was convicted was Ali Karaki, a well-known Hezbollah family to those of us who are, well, let's not say expert, but Hezbollah junkies. At the same time that he was carrying out this surveillance and then being arrested and tried in Baku, his brother, Hassan Karaki, one of several Hezbollah commanders from the Karaki family, was at the dead center of a massive FBI penetration of Hezbollah that I'll tell you about in brief in a moment. A series of other plots targeting Israeli current or former senior officials because to avenge the death of the Prince of Hezbollah Mugni, it had to be also a senior official, uh, continued and each was foiled one after the other, most abroad, two within Israel proper. And that continues to today, by the way. That threat stream continues to today with Hezbollah trying to target senior current or former Israeli officials to avenge Mugnia's death. One of Hezbollah's many poems memorializing uh, Mugnia and kind of explaining the fact that they haven't quite succeeded to avenge his death in all these years is the theme of, don't worry, Israel, we're coming. You'll never know when we're coming. We haven't failed before. We're just waiting for the right moment. They're pretty good at, at psyops. But completely separate from that operational trend is another one having nothing to do with this, nothing to do with Lebanon actually at all. In January 2010, somebody slapped a magnetic sticky bomb in the car of Professor Mohammadi, a particularly important nuclear physicist in Iran's nuclear program as he was driving to work uh, Tehran morning. Not only was he an important person in the nuclear program, but Iran was really beside itself over the optics of their inability to protect key personnel at home. And they were pretty annoyed that there was uh, an act like this in their borders, as we would be if there was one within ours. And they called in the Quds Force, and they called in Hezbollah, and they said, enough. Quds Force, you will create a dedicated new unit, Unit 400. Go target the diplomats of Western countries that are trying to undermine our nuclear program. Israelis, for sure, and you may remember two Februarys ago, three attacks within 24 hours in India, Georgia, and Thailand. But also, at least in one instance, targeting British officials uh, in Africa, that was thwarted pretty easily. And one that was almost not thwarted, again in Baku, there have been almost a dozen plots between Hezbollah and the Quds Force in Baku, targeting not only the U.S. ambassador, not only other U.S. diplomats, but crossing an unwritten red line, specifically targeting their families, not targeting them incidentally. Um, meanwhile, they told Hezbollah, you'll do two things. You have, as Nigel, we discussed before we came up, you have really rusted on the vine since 9-11, and that was because of a conscience Hezbollah decision. Hezbollah was not involved in 9-11, but they were not going to be caught in the crosshairs of that, what we were then calling the war on terrorism, and they did withdraw some operatives from abroad. They left plenty of people specifically to do finance and arms procurement and crime and to facilitate logistics for operations such as infiltrating people into Israel through Europe, through Southeast Asia, in one case through the UK. But they had really rusted on the vine in terms of their ability in, in the near term to conduct acts of terrorism abroad. And so Ron said, take off six, seven, eight months. Recruit the creme de la creme from the Islamic resistance, the Mukawama, your militia. Teach them the dark arts. I want people, they said, with foreign languages, Western complexions, foreign dual nationalities, foreign passports. And then you dispatch them to assassinate Israeli tourists around the world. You want to continue targeting senior Israeli officials to avenge Mugnia? Fine, I understand. It has to be a senior person for a senior person. But to exact a cost on Israel for what Iran perceives probably correctly that Israel has done, probably in line with the West, to undermine Iran's nuclear program and maybe to try and deter them from doing the same in the future. For that, Iran said, we only need to hit uh, Israeli civilians. The Israelis are very sensitive to any civilian loss. And that went on. You're probably all familiar with the case in Burgas, Bulgaria. You may be familiar with the case that was thwarted a week and a half earlier in Cyprus. Uh, Hussein Atris. Well, the guy in Cyprus, Hussein Yakub, was a dual Lebanese Swede. He was the second dual Lebanese Swede to be arrested within six months. Hussein Atris had already been arrested in Thailand. Each of them in Cyprus and Thailand has since been convicted into serving jail terms. Three is Hezbollah operatives are currently on trial in Nigeria. Closing arguments were last week. And a whole host of other surveillances in jo at the airport in Johannesburg and all kinds of other stuff since. Now, both of those operational strands continue. 
but neither at the 100 or maybe even 110% that they were just a few months ago because Hezbollah is so incredibly distracted by its all-in investment in Syria. And I'll just leave that teaser out there for questions and answers. So I want to give two other anecdotes to give some spice. The first is this. The real world is not like Homeland. Though the recent uh, season of Homeland is in fact based loosely on the case of the Amiya Jewish Community Center bombing in 1994 and on the character of Mohsen Rabani, the Iranian operative who was involved in it. In the real world, there's a lot of human element. And in some of the cases where Hezbollah has been the most bumbling, they've succeeded, like in Burgas. And in some cases where they have been the most professional, scary professional, you know, some people refer to Hezbollah as the A-team of terrorists. I don't like it, but they do it because not that they're saying that they're better or more dangerous than Al-Qaeda, but they are better trained in the fine arts, counterintelligence, operational security. And in some of those cases where they've been their most sophisticated, they've failed. There are several examples in Burgas, the most obvious, and you can look up online, the uh, fake driver's license that the Canadian Lebanese bomber carried. The other two people who fled, one was also Canadian Lebanese, one was Australian Lebanese. His license, it's an amazing story. It's an extraordinarily high quality false license. The technical holograms and stuff, it's very, very, very good. It's not, a, it's not the most current uh, Michigan state license, but in the US licenses are good for 10 years. And so by the time your license is over, you usually get one that doesn't look exactly like your old one anyway. It was a perfectly legit looking license, except <clears throat> for two really egregious flaws. One, the person in the picture, and this probably isn't the forger's doing, you get a picture to use, you use it, is wearing such an obvious, ugly, really comical, fake uh, wig. It's like out of a bad, bad, bad comedy show. Very, very straight, like sticking out like this kind of a <laughs> wig. But more to the point, and very much on the forger's account, this is a Michigan license north central United States. And the address on this license is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, <laughs> all the way in the south, several hundred miles apart. It's like having a UK license with an you know, address in the south of Spain, which is really mind boggling. And yet they succeeded. And whereas in Cyprus was one of the most extraordinarily sophisticated operations I've seen. And it's a long story, we can talk about it. Some of it's in the book just a little, uh, I was able to insert some in the editing process. Most of it happened after the book was finished, and there's, I've written a couple of articles about it if you're interested, because I have all of the depositions that the police took of Hussam Yaqub after they arrested him. And they were able to have him dead to rights because the Israelis apparently, someone, it appears to be the Israelis, had told the Cypriots about him. So when he said, no, I haven't been back to the airport since I landed here, they said, well, really, here's the, uh, here are the photographs and the video of you back at the airport last night. Well, okay, I, mean, I was there, but I wasn't conducting surveillance of anybody. Well, here's the video of you doing just that. Well, I certainly didn't write down the license plates of any buses with any Israelis on them. Well, well, here's your little notebook from your hotel room with the license plates written in, by the way, not particularly sophisticated code. And eventually, as tends to happen, uh, he, he, he uh, spilled the beans. Not unprofessionally. He had very good R2I training, resistance to interrogation training, and what we teach our people, I would assume you teach your people, what Hezbollah teaches its people, it's a very professional intelligence organization, is not never spill the beans, everybody talks, but by a week, by a few days, to make sure that anybody who might have been with you has the opportunity to flee. Uh, UK officials found this when they arrested in southern Iraq from Hezbollah's Unit 3800, one of the most dangerous senior Hezbollah operatives ever to be caught abroad, Ali Musa Dukduk al Musawi, who did the exact same thing, and there's a, practically a whole chapter about him in the book. And we now know a lot about him. When was he recruited? Was it in 2010 when Iran said it's time to go assassinate Israeli tourists around the world? No. Was in 2008 maybe, when Mugni was assassinated? And some say that's when Hezbollah got back into the business, although they had never left it, in fact. No. He was recruited more than a year earlier, in 2007. Slowly, methodically, not rushed, sent to Cyprus multiple times, recruited for his foreign Swedish passport. He has a father who's still in Sweden. He had a reason to go. Sent him back to Sweden to renew his about to expire passport. Sent him through Abu Dhabi just to distract. And then had him go on his Lebanese passport to Cyprus again and again and again and again. And the first few times, your operational assignment is you are a tourist, period. 
meet people, show your face, be social, and then go back and do it again. And then go back and do it again. And eventually you start telling the friends that you've made, you know, I've been here a bunch of times and there's some business opportunities here. I think I'm going to look into importing Lebanese juices to Cyprus and maybe exporting Lebanese trinkets to, to Lebanon. In other words, it's not like on TV build a legend in the basement of MI6 or the CIA overnight with all these false docs. It's the best legend there is. It's real under your real name, slowly, slowly. And all these people know you. And when they were ready, they gave him training and weapons and explosives, sure. But more interestingly, before they sent him to do actual surveillance in Cyprus, which he did multiple times, they first sent him as a courier. A trial run first to Turkey. Look for a man wearing the following hat in the following corner outside the following mall in the following city. And if he's not there at the assigned time, leave, go do tourist things and come back at the following time the next day. Straight out of textbook. And he found the guy and apparently did it well. There's no question he was being surveilled to see if he could do it properly. And once he could, then they sent him on some real courier missions to deliver material and bring material back from Hezbollah operatives here in Europe, in Lyon, in Amsterdam. And then they sent him on surveillance trips to Cyprus. Now, on the final trip, he was carrying out surveillance of Israeli tourists getting off the chartered plane and onto their tour bus, of course. And he was arrested and that was that. He's since been sentenced and he has four years in jail. But in fact, it wasn't the first time. He had been on earlier surveillance runs, including, for example, being asked to look for restaurants that serve kosher food, which either mean that Hezbollah was asking him to look for Jewish targets or that he had a particular interest in kosher food, like one might in Thai or Chinese food. I leave you to decide which it might be. I have an opinion on the matter. He was also asked to surveil two specific hotels. One he did, the other he couldn't. It was under renovation. And then maybe most interestingly, he was asked to surveil a particular and what appears to be random parking lot between a traffic police and a hospital and asked to collect very specific information. Can you park overnight? Do you leave your keys? Do you get a card? Is there someone stationed there? Is it sheltered? Is it not? And we don't quite know why. What I told the Cypriots is, don't get too excited. I'm not saying that there was a plot in the making there, but there is precedent of Hezbollah having interest, operational interest in parking lots. Sometimes they do this to do a near-term plot. Sometimes they do this just for operational planning for off the shelf. But in 92 in Buenos Aires when they blew up the Israeli embassy, and in 94, not two years later, when they blew up the Amia Jewish Community Center, and just a few weeks before the Amia bombing, across the world, when they came this close to blowing up the Israeli embassy in Bangkok. An amazing story. In all three cases, they took their car bomb, really a van bomb, they were quite large, and they parked them in parking lots within a one to two mile radius of the target the night before. So I told the secrets, don't get excited. I, we, I have no idea if this is accurate or not, but there is this precedent, and we'll see what's, what's within that two mile radius, and even if it is, that might just be off the shelf planning. Let me end with this story that I alluded to earlier. Uh, in the United States of uh, Hassan Karaki, the brother in Lebanon, uh, whose brother, Ali Karaki, uh, was caught trying to blow up the Israeli ambassador in Baku. And I tell it not just to show you that Hezbollah is not just in Europe or in Cyprus. We have this in the United States, too. It's a global problem. We're all dealing with it, I think, actually quite well. But also, I, I want people to understand that while Hezbollah is capable and they are dangerous, they're calculating and they're not looking to blow things up at any turn. On the one hand, on the other hand, our law enforcement and intelligence services are really, in ways they weren't right after 9-11. Like I said, I was at the FBI at the time. We had other focuses, obviously. Very, very focused on this issue. Around 2008, 2009, there is a low-level Hezbollah supporter criminal in Brooklyn, New York, Ali Musa Hamden, who's doing stolen cell phones and stolen PlayStations and a couple of stolen cars, and he's getting them and selling them out through Hezbollah block, block, black market networks. And make a long story short, FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force in Philadelphia get wind of him because he's moved from Brooklyn, New York, all the way to southern New Jersey, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is just across the river from Philadelphia. On one side of the river, it's Pennsylvania. On the other side of the river, it's New Jersey. But Cherry Hill, New Jersey is a suburb, immediate suburb of Philadelphia. The Joint Terrorism Task Force from Philadelphia finds out about this guy. It's a long story you can read about it in the book. They start investigating. They find out that this guy is a low-level guy, and he's making some money for himself, but some of the money is going back to Hezbollah. They insert a source who's posing as a low-level foot soldier for the Philadelphia Mafia. 
Hezbollah watches too many episodes of The Soprano, I am sure, and here is why. They take to the source immediately, and they start fencing stolen items. And after a few weeks, Ali Musa says to the source, look, forget this stuff. This is nickels and dimes. This is small change. I got to ask you, if I go to my older brother in Beirut, who's an actual mid-level Hezbollah guy, I'm a nobody, and I vouch for you, and I get permission from him to see you and to show you to some more senior people in Lebanon, would you go? Because if you go, and if they meet you, and if they like you, forget this fencing stolen stuff. If we get their permission, we could do huge money in counterfeit. Hezbollah has massive counterfeit uh, capabilities. I'm talking, he says, a million US dollars at a time. FBI is thrilled. Source says yes, goes to Beirut. They say, you know what, kid, we like you. We can do business with you. So for the next two days, we're going to take you on glorious downtown Beirut. There's lots of sites, a beautiful place. And we'll take pictures of you as a tourist. We won't be in the pictures. It's not good operational security. But you'll be. And a couple of weeks after you get home, we'll, we'll develop the pictures. We'll put them in an album for you and we'll mail it to you. And just as he's thinking, why in the hell do I need you to mail me an album of pictures of me? It's like the ultimate selfie. They say, and when you get it, rip off the actual front outside cover, the glued actual album. Rip it off. And then secreted inside the album, you will find two samples of our best $100 counterfeit bill. I swear to God, you will not be able to tell the difference. You show that to your mafia boss in Philadelphia, we'll do good business. We'll give you a good price. Goes home, two weeks, album, rips it off. Two crisp, brand new bills. Never seen the light of day. Brand new bills. Unfortunately for Hezbollah, this guy's working for the JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, which includes Secret Service, which runs counterfeit investigations in the United States. Secret Service comes back and they say, well, we got good news and we got bad news. It's one and the same. It's not counterfeit. It's real stuff. So our first assumption, this is long after I left the FBI, long after I left Treasury, but once you've been in government, it's hard not to say wait. Their first assumption was that Hezbollah was trying to scam the mob. It's an old scam. You tell someone I got the best counterfeit in the world, you won't be able to tell the difference, and you can't because it's real. And therefore, I say I can give you a great but high price, say 80, 85 cents in the dollar for this phenomenal counterfeit. And then when I do the deal under a couple of layers of real money, I give you that, you know, ever go and spend a, a big bill and they have that little purple pen, the purple highlighter, and I'll give you pen quality. Like my 14 year old could probably counterfeit, uh, maybe, I hope not, but it doesn't take much to counterfeit a, a pen quality. It's very low, maybe 30 cents in the dollar. And you scan like 50 cents on a bill. And then they send this bill to my former office at Treasury's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. And they say, whoa, it just got interesting. We ran the serial numbers. This is real money, all right. It's real US government money that we sent in a huge pallet to the new government of Iraq to reconstruct the government of Iraq. And somehow, it's from a package that got stolen. So Hezbollah appears to have stolen US government money for reconstruction in Iraq from Iraq, taken it to Lebanon, sent it to the United States where they're passing it off as counterfeit. I'm a CT Hezbollah junkie. I'm thinking this is fantastic. I'm having a ball now. So they tell the source, go back to Ali Musa Hamdan and do your best Gambino. Bada bing, bada bang. Tell him you're going to rip his head off. There's going to be blood everywhere. You're really angry. And he does. And Ali Musa goes white and says, I'll tell you what. We've already agreed that my boss is coming from Lebanon to meet with your boss, the mafioso, in Miami. He'll explain everything. And in fact, we did. They did. FBI put together a great sting operation. Not the top two guys, but the number three guy, still a pretty senior guy in Hezbollah, is lured to the United States on this deal, this fake deal. We get an Italian-American undercover FBI agent to pose as a mafia don. They do watch too many episodes of The Sopranos. It went sort of like this. Well, you, you probably, your boss probably has a, a mansion in Miami, right? And they said, uh, sure. And we rented one. And we wired it. And so this guy comes to Miami. Hardest part was getting the State Department to issue the visa, but that's another story. And take him out for late night dinners. And then as Middle Easterners tend to like to do, there was late night conversations for going late into the night, well within earshot of the mics placed strategically throughout the room. And first he starts bragging about Hezbollah's access to Iranian satellites for better targeting of Israeli cities in the north with its rockets during the July 2006 war. Then he starts bragging about the 18 hours a day that these fantastic counterfeit machines that they've gotten from Iran are running and the really high quality paper that they're getting from Iran to make these bills. We prefer to do $100 bills or 200 euro notes, but we can do you know, dirham, rial, whatever you want. And then he says, 
Oh, and about that little misunderstanding with the non-counterfeit. Look, I'm going to tell you something we haven't talked about publicly, but we're about to do good business, you and I. You just can't tell anybody, he says into the mic. February 2008, somebody found Imad Mugnia. His nickname was The Fox. His nickname was The Man Who Never Sleeped. He reportedly had facial reconstructive surgery. Three times CIA almost got him one time, every time foiled, once foiled by a close Western European country, not yours. Um, Who and how? Well, they're not quite sure who. They're pretty sure it was the Israelis, but they're not quite sure how, but they have a theory. Hezbollah is a serious intelligence organization. And they run damage assessments when things go wrong and lessons learned. I've been involved in this type of thing in my government. It's not pleasant to do, but you do it so that it doesn't happen again. And they said, one of our theories, and as the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, I love this story. They fear that somebody followed the money. What money, you ask? Excellent question. He goes on to explain that Hezbollah has had a notional idea of an operation that's been going on for years. And when its operatives or supporters, and there really is a large spectrum, have the opportunity to steal money around the world, they do. They talked about a time where they took down a bank in Sweden and stole $2 million worth of Swedish krona. They talked about a whole bunch of other things, taking down an ATM, hitting a bodega or a mom and pop store. And you take the money and you send it to Iran. And it sits in it quiet for a few years just to make sure that things have cooled off. And then it gets couriered by human courier through Turkey or Syria to Lebanon to Imad Mugnia, he explains. This is Imad Mugnia's terrorist slush fund. Because when you're actually doing operations, you don't mess around with counterfeit. You do the real thing. And you don't show up and start taking large sums of money out of a bank. You show up with the money you need. And in case we're not clear that this isn't Hezbollah's campaign finance fund, or that it's not Hezbollah's orphan and widow's fund, he says, and I quote you from the transcripts. This is Hezbollah, comma, terrorism Hezbollah. Like, like, you get it, idiot? This is the real thing. And they're afraid that we followed that money right back to Mugnia. Now, they got to get rid of the money, but it's good money. You can, I mean, you're not, what are you going to do? Shred it? You're going to burn it? This is good stuff. So instead, they're passing it off as counterfeit around the world. Since the book has come out, by the way, I've been doing a lot of briefing for law enforcement and intelligence around the world. I've been doing it here this week. And I've found out about a whole bunch of cases around the world where investigators have been scratching their heads trying to figure out why Lebanese criminals with ties to Hezbollah have been passing off real bills as counterfeit. And I think we now know why. The bottom line is very dangerous, not like Al-Qaeda, and we're equally capable. The problem is we need to be able to thwart every incident. We need to succeed just once. But the last thing I'll say, let me end where I began, lest anybody misunderstand. This book is just about Hezbollah outside Lebanon. And there's a lot to discuss, stuff that wasn't in the public domain until now. By no means is this meant to say that this is the only part of Hezbollah. This is one aspect of Hezbollah, and I focused on filling that gap. If you want to understand Hezbollah, you can't just read this book. You have to read other books about Hezbollah domestically in Lebanon. It's critically important. But if you only read those books and you don't read mine, although I really what I want is for you to buy it. Once you buy it, I really don't care if you read it. But if you don't read this, then you won't understand Hezbollah either. I want to thank Nigel for taking the opportunity. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure always to sit on a dais with you, double I, double S. Uh, you do me credit by inviting me and all of you by taking the time today. Thank you very much. Matt, thank you very much indeed. That was fascinating. One of the nice things about working in double I, double S is that you get to spend so much time you know, um, learning to know about these really wonderful and warm human beings that uh, <laughs> seem to occupy most of our time. Um, we've got about 15 minutes for questions and comments. I am under instructions to wrap up uh, on schedule, so could I ask you if you want to make a question or comment, please be brief and before you make it, tell us who you are. Yes, gentleman on the front row here. So uh, Jack, can you please just wait for the microphone? Yeah. Um, so my name's Colonel Tim Law, I'm uh, British Army, um, and I'm, I actually came up for something else today, and it's great to have the opportunity to come. Thank you very much for your um, lecture. Uh, my question is um, to what extent might Hezbollah um, provide a model? for other non-state groups? Is it feasible for them to do so? And what about its activities? Are they a taste of things to come? 
you want to go on a time? Yeah, uh, okay, we maybe take uh, that one first and let people warm up. I've intimidated them. Yeah. Or, or, or I've been so thorough. Yeah. Um, it's an excellent question. Hezbollah is a very unique and exceptionally effective model in that it is not just a militant group, in that within its militancy, it does more than one type of militancy, part of which, at a minimum, many people see as perfectly legitimate, the militia side, and which I would see as not legitimate, but as something other than terrorism under standard definitions of terrorism, maybe violations of international law of other kind, uh, abducting Israeli soldiers from within Israel proper. But that's probably not, under most definitions, an act of terrorism as such. But by virtue of muddying the waters between overt and covert, legitimate and illegitimate, and when they do the illegitimate, the most illegitimate, the terrorism, the asymmetric warfare, they do it with reasonable deniability. It's actually not the most important to them that you never, ever find out what they did. They recognize that, especially in today's day and age, that's not likely, but that it be reasonably deniable. Burgess? What's a Burgess? I've been to Burgas. I've never been to Burgas. No, we don't know what you're talking about. And that is an extraordinarily effective model. It's very, very different from the Al-Qaeda model. But we are slowly seeing some Sunni extremist groups following suit. The most obvious and longstanding, of course, though it's very different than Al-Qaeda, again, is Hamas. And Hamas learned this and its militancy uh, from Hezbollah both, in particular in 1992, when the Israelis deported 419 or so Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants to a barren hilltop in southern Lebanon called Marj al-Zahur, where they stayed for about a year and a half and were literally schooled in the art of bomb making and suicide bombing. Hamas had one attempted suicide bombing prior, complete disaster. These guys come back, especially the uh, renowned uh, bomber uh, Mahmoud Abu Anud and others, and, and suddenly they have tremendous skills, but they also learned uh, something that already started as a Muslim Brotherhood entity, the art of combining this with proselytizing and social welfare, dawah activity. What's interesting is we're now seeing really kind of hardcore Al-Qaeda groups doing the same. Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria is very much providing uh, courts and uh, support, uh, political structures, food, health care in ways kind of Al-Qaeda core never ever did and never ever would have. And so I think that yes, this, for some is more of a model than others. The last thing is that, again like Hamas, Hezbollah is a rare bird in that it is Islamist and it has interests it has interest in Lebanon, of course. It has the strategic partnership with Iran, of course. It also has interest in protecting Shia, not only in Lebanon but beyond. But it is, it has a nationalistic piece to it as well. It doesn't stop at the Lebanese border clearly, but that is a different kind of hybrid group than some others. Okay, two ladies, one in the second from back row and then Virginia Camoli in the front row. Uh, yeah, hello, uh, Olivia Bosch, a former UN 1540 committee expert and member. Can we take you up on your offer to explain how Isbullah is distracted currently in Syria? Okay, and Virginia. Thank you. I was wondering whether you could tell us a little about Hezbollah's involvement in West Africa and more specifically to what extent they are involved in organized criminal activities. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you both for your questions. Olivia, uh, and, and, and you know some of the answer to this uh, probably from your background. Hezbollah is all in in Syria and it's costing it at home huge, huge political costs. Um, the best estimates I've seen, and much of what has been in the public media, is just grossly overstated. I've seen as much as 10 to 12,000 uh, Hezbollah operatives in Syria in the media, and that's ridiculous. The best estimates I've seen from talking to lots of people in lots of countries is about four to 5,000 at any given time doing 30-day rotations. Uh, that's still a very significant uh, a footprint, especially since uh, these are not only kind of uh, uh, boots in the ground fighters, a lot of this is commanding others. There are Iraqi Shia militants operating in Syria under Hezbollah command. There are Syrian militias operating under Hezbollah command. And the Iraqi Shia side, by the way, it shouldn't surprise, a lot of these guys were trained by Unit 3800, Hezbollah's unit in, uh, operating in Iraq during the last coalition war. And that's, uh, there's a whole chapter on that uh, in the book. 
I don't think Hezbollah is taking losses enough to really mitigate and undermine their military capability on the ground because they're taking losses in the hundreds, even in the upper hundreds, let's even say maybe a little over a, a thousand at the, at the very, very high end, which I think is probably an exaggeration. An Israeli official who's in a position to know told me, look, Matt, they are taking uh, greater losses from more significant people in a shorter period of time than we, meaning the Israelis, have ever inflicted on them. So if you, as, you, as you extrapolate over time, it could be that this ends up hurting too much. Where it's really hurting right now is in their standing in Lebanon. And again, strategic partnership with Iran, absolutely. But they care about their position in Lebanon. And anybody who tells you otherwise couldn't be more misinformed. And right now, the high of their position and the kind of hero worship of Nasrallah that followed the 2006 war, and that they were even able to recover and maintain after the 2008 takeover of downtown Beirut when they turned their arms reportedly only for resistance against Israel against fellow Lebanese and killed fellow Lebanese. An act, parenthetically, which the government of New Zealand cited as an act of terrorism under their definition as part of their designation of Hezbollah's military wing. They still were able to rebuild what they call their words, not mine, a culture of resistance in Lebanon. Today, they have helped create in Syria and now by extension, flowing over the borders east to Iraq and west into Lebanon. They've taken something that was a rebellion and became a civil war and turned it into a, a sectarian blood fest, which is spilling over borders, affecting Sunni areas and Shia areas, both in Lebanon. And if you are a Lebanese of any confessional element or religion or ethnicity, your greatest single fear is renewed civil war. The government's position under a Hezbollah, the last Hezbollah-led government was disassociation. Lebanon will not be associated with what's going on. We will not be dragged into what's going on in Lebanon. Now, no question, Hezbollah is not the only party in Lebanon that's, con that's contributing to the violence there, to be sure. But Hezbollah was what first got into this, and it's one, the one that is dragging this across the border into Lebanon. And it's not just the Sunnis. It's not just Christians with the exception of those, the Free Patriotic Movement of General Aoun, who ally with uh, the Shia, the Maronite community is divided in many ways in Lebanon. One of them is those who are more afraid of the Shia, and the others are more, those who are more afraid of the Sunnis. Um, but also the Shia. There are many Shia who are very angry at Hezbollah right now. But I think Hezbollah has a strategy. The strategy is forget about the Sunnis right now. We're in a sectarian war with them. Even forget about the Christians, but if there's a way to take some of the Christians who aren't yet aligned with us and to convince them to be even more afraid of those crazy, lunatic, Al-Qaeda, Takfiri, Salafi, Jihadi, frothing at the mouth barbarians, then we'll do that because then they may support us against them. Some of those people who used to be more afraid of the Shia may soon become more afraid of the Sunnis. As for the Shia, what's the simple answer? Contrary to Western conventional wisdom, double down in Syria. Because the more you make this Hezbollah a confessional sectarian war, the more in time, and I think already, the Shia of Lebanon, including those who were very, very angry over what Hezbollah has done, which is, by the way, clearly not in any Lebanese interest. So for a group that tries to always portray everything it does as being the Lebanese interest, this is a real shock. They will circle the wagons in support of Hezbollah for fear that if they don't, and if Hezbollah loses, that those frothing in the mouth barbarians, Salafi, Jihadi, Al-Qaeda, Takfiris, will butcher us all which, by the way, is exactly the radicalization and recruitment message that Iran is using, mostly with Iraqi Shia militants, but also in Lebanon, as we've seen from some of the videos that came out and have been in the press already, some of which quite clearly were never intended to be made public. There's more to answer that, but we're running out of time, and I've got to answer Virginia. Hezbollah in West Africa, and it's not just West Africa, but the biggest footprint is in West Africa. I was pretty surprised to see as much activity as I did in East Africa. Um, is significant. I want to be very, very clear here, however. We are not talking about the Lebanese expatriate diaspora community. Let us never tar and feather the, such a whole community, the vast majority of which is law-abiding good people. And even within the Shia diaspora, not all of them are Hezbollah fans. And within the diaspora that is Hezbollah fans, the majority are not fans of the stuff we're talking about. They're fans of Hezbollah because Hezbollah has supported their confessional element and they raised money abroad when their diaspora communities the same way the Maronites did and the Sunnis did. Some of them may like the fact that they stand up to Israel. Most of them are not providing money because, yay, Hezbollah terrorism, let me, let me give you more. There are some. And there are some very big donors. 
in particular, a bunch of whom my former office at the Treasury Department has, has done a lot of work exposing. Uh, there's just now this week I've been hearing about more things, not new things, but more things on timber smuggling and uh, all kinds of other things. There's debate, for example, as to whether Al-Qaeda was or was not ever in blood diamonds. There is no debate that Hezbollah was in blood diamonds in a very significant way. Um, and we're talking about everything from abusive charities to mafia-style shakedowns of the communities. It'd be a shame, Nigel, if someone broke into your store uh, and, and looted all your stuff. But if you put this uh, Hezbollah collection box here, I'm sure that no one will touch your store. But you really should fill it, fill it every, every couple of weeks. I'll be back. There's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And also in places even like Angola. There, We watched as the heat got turned up in South after the Argentina bombings. And we watched as some people left for Africa, including Angola. And we can't say for sure that this is why, but some, at the same time that some of these guys who were doing these mafia-style shakedowns in South Africa are moving to Africa, you start seeing these mafia-style shakedowns in Africa. So really all kinds of things. Front companies, uh, we're talking about um, investment firms, we're talking about supermarkets. You know, supermarket is at the, at the crux of this case in Nigeria right now. Uh, and, and much, much more. I was amazed. I thought I knew there'd be a chapter on Africa. I thought it'd be a pretty short chapter. It's a very big chapter. Okay, thank you very much. We, if anybody wants to raise one last question, uh, yes, uh, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny Nielsen. I work here in the Nonproliferation and Disarmament Program. Fascinating and frightening um, equally. But um, could you tell us a bit about Hezbollah's activities in Venezuela and Ecuador, if you will? I spend a lot of time calming people down on Venezuela, Mexico. Uh, there was reports of stuff in Cuba. You can ignore that. Um, <clears throat> not because there isn't a presence, and I talk about it in the book. There is. Um, and under the Chavez regime, we had real, real concerns. At one point, my former office at Treasury designated two, at the time, current Venezuelan diplomats of Middle Eastern extraction. If I recall correctly, one was from Lebanon, one was from Syria, or their families were. I don't remember if they were born in Venezuela or not. They were serving in Lebanon and Syria as Venezuelan diplomats and acting as Hezbollah operatives, not just fundraising, ops meetings, um, which, uh, which we disclosed in the designation. By the way, Treasury, U.S. Treasury press releases on these things. They always include some actual declassified intelligence they're worth looking at as a research tool. Um, but the idea that you might have seen in the press of training camps, no. And they don't need that. They would never need that. And if they wanted something like that, they'd do it in some place much more secure, like the tri-border area where Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina meet. And they don't have a need for doing that there either. There are some people who have written about Hezbollah Venezuela. You might have heard of this. This Hezbollah Venezuela has nothing to do with Lebanese Hezbollah, period. It does have to do with Iran. Iran has successfully, in its effort to increase uh, Shiism, uh, although not, it's not clear that they're actually Shia, but there is an indigenous uh, Indian tribe, an indigenous Venezuelan tribe that has converted they don't apparently know very much about either Sunni or Shia Islam, but they call themselves Venezuelan Hezbollah. Have fun with that. Um, so we do have concerns even now under the new uh, government. Uh, it's still not entirely friendly. Uh, there are lots of concerns. I'd say the bigger concerns are Iran, uh, sanctions busting. Uh, there's been all kinds of talk about potential deals on uranium. Um, there are Hezbollah support networks. The largest and oldest is in Margarita Island. Again, stand-up Lebanese community, some very bad people within it. You could say that about every community of every ethnicity. There's, you, know, you can go to places in Africa, Virginia. You can go to some of the same seedy hotel bars and brothels, and you can find Lebanese Hezbollah and Israeli organized international criminals doing business together. Not Israeli Arabs, Jewish Israelis, because it's all business, and they're both criminals. Right? Let's be clear, bad guys within every community. And on that, let me stop. 
Well, Matt, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but this has been a fascinating and very stimul stimulating uh, presentation. I don't know whether your intention in coming here was to scare us to death, but uh, I think I can safely say that you have succeeded. I'm trying to scare you into buying the yeah, book. Indeed. I'd love to tell you all the anecdotes yeah. in it, but A, we don't have time, and B, yeah. I really want you to buy the book. And, and Matt, you, you, you don't want to explain on camera why it would not be in people's interest not to buy it. So, yeah. uh, But uh, seriously, Thank you very much for taking the time to, to come here and give us a very stimulating talk. Please join me in thanking Matt. Thank you all. <laughs>